Welcome to my sewing room. We have such an exciting show for you today. It's all about wonderful bias bindings and fabulous trims. And of course, we always have lots of embellishment also. This is a wonderful, wonderful suit. I want you to look, jacket rather, to the suit. I want you to look at this beautiful trim that goes around the neckline. Wonderful trim and wonderful, uh, interesting details with machines all the way down. And then this beautiful trim that is that trims the belt as as well as a really pretty machine embroidered motif. This looks like something that came out of the finest of stores. Now, I want you to look at the trims on this blouse. Once again, a pretty trim. You know what? This trim looks almost like tatting, and it was done on the sewing machine. And then, of course, wonderful trims that go all the way down the front of the blouse, making it ever so elegant. Now this blouse has a really beautiful bias binding around the neckline. You know, sometimes it's hard to get bias bindings just perfect. We're gonna share with you how to do that on this show. This bias binding has a little trim that is on the edge, also made on the sewing machine out of the same color, which makes it so very pretty with a little bit of tone on tone machine embroidery in the center. This is an interesting way to use bias bindings. This jacket has wonderful machine embellishment just, just scrolling all over, and here's where we've used the bias trim, not a bias binding, but a bias trim, as buttonholes for these three wonderful big buttons. Now, isn't that good looking? And then this jacket has a really beautiful trim around the collar. This is a bias trim with some more interesting trim, beautiful machine stitching. And I want you to see exactly how this has been done. We have machine stitching, making the little squares, and then a wonderful machine embroidery has been stitched right in the middle of each square. With, this is done out of the pink wool. Let me show you the back of this jacket too. It could not be more beautiful. Machine trim here, the piping, and then all the way down to the bottom Bottom, more wonderful, beautiful machine embroidery and the tassel in the back. Come on over to the boards with me and we're going to share with you some techniques about how to make wonderful bias bindings. Using a wonderful bias binding, handkerchief linen, and actually some old tea-dyed handkerchiefs, you will love this beautiful shell, which is one of our patterns for this series. The bias binding comes around the arm's eye of the shell, around the neck of the shell, and you're gonna love the side. The bias binding comes all the way down the side and ties in a little knot to finish it and goes around the bottom. Now let me show you the skirt that goes with this blouse. Is this wonderful or what? Let me open it up a little bit for you. With the points on the bottom, the antique lace is stitched over the skirt. Actually, the, the handkerchiefs are used around the waistline, all gathered up pretty, and then the, po the skirt comes down in little points. What a designer skirt. Now the theme of the show, of this segment, is making bias bindings. You can use a little bias binding maker, or Marlis is gonna show you in a few minutes how to use a sewing machine to do all of this for you. We're gonna make round bias. We're gonna turn, uh, go around the uh, neckline with the bias. We're going to turn a square corner with bias, and as you saw in the dress a minute ago, we're going to bind the seams with bind bias binding. I'm so happy to have as my guest today my dear friend Marlis Bennett. Marlis is a training consultant for Bernina of America, and Marlis, I'm so happy to have you on the show again. Well, thank you. <laughs> this is so much fun. And bindings are a perfect edge finish, and a bias binder maker for the machine makes it so easy. But I want to show a, a tip, because many people don't have a binder the other for their machine for their machine <laughs> but for um, you can buy the ones that are the the little ones that you find in your sewing stores and you would just take a piece of fabric and you have to read the instructions it'll tell you how wide it needs to be now a lot of people turn the binder upside down or turn it so that the fabric comes out with the fold coming to the top but I find it's much easier if I have it turned so that the fold is at the bottom because I can keep it nice and taut and then this way as I pull the bias uh, maker in front of the iron, it presses it all flat for me, and it's a one-step operation that way without having to go back and press again. That's and then, a wonderful trick right there, just putting it facing down rather than facing right. up. Right, and then if you want to, then you'll have to go back in and sew it on. You know, put your sandwich your fabric in between and then sew it on with your sewing machine. Okay. However, 
I'm going to show you a product that we can use on the sewing machine. It's called a, a flat binder, actually. And it will go around curves, and it also will do a corner, and that's what we're going to show you today. Now, you need to cut the fabric in a prescribed length according to the instructions because there are different sizes of binders out there. And what I like to do, and this is my tip to share with, with all of your readers, is I like to make sure that I floss. Did you see me floss that through? Let me try it again. Okay, Just floss your binding through to okay, get everything okay, turning okay. right at the right, right time. Also, the other tip is to start your fabric first, lightly, before you cut your bias strips. And then that way you don't have any problems as as you're trying to sew. And now, you're going around a corner and you have any, oh, this is fascinating. This is so much, so easy. It's the oh. easiest way to construct a garment. Now, I've selected a straight stitch and moved my stitch width over towards where the fabric for, uh, curls because the binder maker on the front will actually, it has a curl in here, and it will actually take that fabric and curl it like this and then sew it over whatever you put in there. There, I know a quilt maker that uses this binder for uh, finishing off his quilts. Now look how easy it was to go around that curve. Well, honest, I just can't believe it. Is that not just easy? Now can you, you imagine there's several different widths available of this? Yes, there are. Now is that not just the easiest way to go around a corner I never that you've ever seen? Like it. Oh. And because it's bias, when you press it, it's going to lay flat. Of course, you can do the other side just as easily. I'm going to show you how to turn a corner now because that people, you know, it's one of those things you've got to practice it a few times. But with a little practice, it's as easy as can be. So you're going to miter this corner? I'm going to miter this wow. corner. But remember, you'll need to practice. There are okay. just some things in life we have to practice. Sew okay. to the very edge of your fabric. And that is the trick. You must sew right to the edge. And then I like to just take a few stitches, pull out, and because I'm a neat nick, I'm going to clip my thread so that they do not get in the way. Pull your fabric. You can see where it's still curled because it's coming out of the binder. Fold it to the corner. As okay. you can see right here, we have a mitered corner. And then fold it over this way. And when I sew, do you see how perfect that miter is? Uh, it's just unbelievable. I'm going to bring, put this back underneath my machine. And some people will use a sewing machine needle and run a thread through there and then pull it from the back. But I have found that I can just take my needle and bobbin thread and do the same thing. As long as I have some out here, I'm OK and help it ease through. Well, Marlis, that is amazing. Is that not just the, the greatest thing? Completely perfect. I can certainly see how you could use this to bind a quilt. Oh, see? And it's a perfectly bound corner. And of course, when you're making a garment such as the one that you've shown, the fabric is going to, sh the thread is going to show on both sides. So you'll want to have the same color thread in both your bobbin and in your upper tension. But you know, on TV, we have to sh make sure that we show our stitching. And so I've chosen the red today. You can, on your ends, when you come to ends, you can either put, start the other one over the top of this one. You can bring them to the back of your garment, put them into a seam, or do like I did on the on the skirt and just tie them into a knot. And then that I way, thought that was really cute. It's on the bias. Cut it. You've got it finished, and there's nothing else you need to do. A real cute little it's designer a, treatment there. Well, <laughs> it's a, it's a fast way to finish off your your uh, garment. But this type of binder maker will make your life so much easier, and it saves about 50% of your sewing time. Well, I certainly believe that. It, it just held it and did it all in one operation. I, I love I it. Marlis, thank you so much for teaching us all about bindings. And next, Marlis has a garment construction tip for you. Marlis, would you show us a little bit about the, the garment construction using that bias binding? Sure, because it's the only foot I used on the entire garment. So. It was well worth On the it. entire On garment. On the entire garment. <laughs> I even finished off our top edge with the binding, catching all of the handkerchiefs in at one time. 
Now what I've done to lay out, you have to start planning this a little bit. You need to find a handkerchief, first of all, for the blouse top. And what I did is I just found one that would fit a pretty one that would fit within the corners right here and then pinned it down and then with a very narrow, narrow little stitch, straight stitch right along the edge and I free motioned that one. Okay. You know, just drop the feed teeth and then just go to sewing and, and that way I could keep it so it was nearly invisible. I then added all of the trims. Now these are fun because I just took the trims and laid them down on my, my, piece, my skirt panels in a manner that was pleasing. Okay. And just took all of the laces, laid them down. Now the fun part was you can really play with this. Depending on how much time you have, you can use just the basic pin stitch or use one of the beautiful decorative stitches that's on the sewing machine to highlight your lace. And then for the construction part of the garment, I took my skirt pieces. I've got two pieces here and they're wrong sides together. Everything is finished because you will see the binding on, the, on outs the outside of that gorgeous skirt. Oh. So you don't have any fitting problems or anything because you can adjust as you go. Now one little tip that I'd like to share with everybody is sometimes we try to do bindings with very, very thin fabrics. Mm -hmm. And I have found, especially when I'm trying to work with heirloom fabrics, that if I'll just take my handy screwdriver okay. and place it into the machine right here and then sew. It will hold all of that thin fabric You're in pushing place. Over to the right, I'm, I'm okay. not even pushing. I'm You're just, just holding. I'm holding it in there because sometimes we try to bind very thin fabrics mm -hmm. and very fine fabrics and I have found it just does better like that. So that's my tip to share with your readers. The other thing is your all of your hankies just overlap and then they place them around and the, around the waistline and then and then finish the top edge off. Oh, Marlis, thank you so much for sharing with us about these wonderful bias binder and there well two different kinds of bias wow. bindings. Marlis, thank you so much for well, being thanks. here with us. And now I have a beautiful doll dress for you. This little doll dress I have to share with you is a total masterpiece. It's done out of a little print cotton, and the little round collar has beautiful uh, silk ribbon embroidered by hand, and we've put ecru laces. What I really want to talk about mostly today on this doll dress, and then we'll do the little skirt on another show, I want you to look at this magnificent sleeve. It has two rows of tiny piping with a contrasting fabric in the middle and silk ribbon embroidery right on the contrasting fabric. And then once again, look at the details on this. Isn't that precious and we have the tiny piping at the top of the, of the armband, tiny piping at the bottom of the little cuff, and then gathered lace. And you can go ahead and look at the rest of this little dress, but we'll talk to you about how this truly different skirt was made on another show. What I'd like to do now is share with you how that little tiny piped section got in the middle of that sleeve. First of all, you need to make tiny piping. And then I have my contrasting, the blue section here, so I'll move my piping over on one side and I will straight stitch right down the, the, on the same line as the piping. I'll move my piping in on the other side and once again straight stitch down the piping. Now after I do that I have to bring my fabric in to attach it so I will bring my fabric over, line everything up and I've already put it under the sewing machine here because the easy way to sew this now is to turn it over and sew it from the side where I, where I already have done my straight stitching. And I've already got it started here. And you know what else I think is a really good trick? To use a pin tuck foot because you can have the groove, let me find my foot pedal here, you can have the groove of that tiny piping fitting in the pin tuck groove and it makes it so easy just to make perfect piping every time. When you use the pin tuck foot to help you guide so you can sew right along that same line of stitching that you had before. Okay. Now that I've attached both sides, you can see the piping is the center contrasting fabric, the beautiful tiny baby piping, and then I've attached the side pieces. The next thing to do on this sleeve, of course, is to trace out, using your pattern to trace out the sleeve so I can then go in and cut out the sleeve 
And here I've done that. I've cut out the sleeve and you can see those beautiful little tiny pieces of piping and you can make piping as small as you want to. That's absolutely a wonderful way to get a delicate look. So I have the two little pieces of piping and those are the tricks of making perfect piping, tiny baby piping. And now go get the kids, bring them to the television set because we have a sewing segment that is easy enough for the kids to do, fun for the kids to do called So Cool for Kids. I'm so happy to have as my guest today my daughter Joanna. Joanna, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Today, kids, we are going to make a skirt for your 18-inch baby doll. Let me show them the waist of the skirt. A little elastic around the waist. Uh-huh. The first step in making this skirt is to cut your pattern out. Once you cut your pattern out, it's going to be, it's going to look like a rectangle. Next, on one edge, you are going to zigzag all the way down the fabric. And on the other side, you are going to fold a quarter of an inch and straight stitch all the way down. Next, you are going to fold the skirt in half. Make sure you have right sides together. After you have folded the skirt, you are going to then straight stitch and side zigzag. So, yeah, straight to the side seam and then zigzag. After your skirt is sewn together, it's time to make the hem, the bottom of the skirt hem, and the elastic waist. For the bottom of the skirt, you're simply going to fold your material a half an inch and pin all the way around. And then you're going to straight stitch and close the hem. On the top of the skirt where the elastic is, you're going to fold it half an inch and then you're going to straight stitch it. But remember you've got to leave a little bit for the elastic to go through, a little hole for the elastic to go through. Finally you're going to take your bodkin and you're going to run elastic all the way around through the skirt and once you've gotten to the where the elastic meets you simply sew it and then sew, that ho sew, sew the hole back together. It's as simple you know, as Joanna, that. When I was a little girl, we didn't have any bodkins, or I didn't know about uh -huh. bodkins. So when we wanted to run elastic, we just put a safety pin through it uh -huh. and ran the elastic with the safety pin. You can pin. do that as well. Joanna, this is such an easy skirt to make oh, that it's our fun. kids can really make it yourself. And moms and grandmoms, please let these kids make the skirt because they really can. And now, the kids don't go away because we have some kids' embroidery for you by hand. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, Claudia Newton. Claudia is the editorial director of the Fancy Work section of So Beautiful magazine. She has studied embroidery at the Japanese School of Embroidery and at the Royal School of Needlework in London. Claudia, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. We're going to do a, a fun little thing today. We're going to learn to do running stitch. And I've done mine on a stationary folder. I've made a bow, but there are a few things you need before you get started, so let's talk Talk about how to begin an embroidery project if you've never done one before. This one is made on just a little placemat, an imported little piece that we have, and we were able to just fold it in half and draw our lines on it. You may have a different project, but the first thing you have to do is to get the design onto the fabric. You'll start with usually a design that someone else has drawn for you. We call it a template. It's just a drawing of your finished project. What you'll need to do is to trace that onto paper that you can see through, like this. And then if you can see through it, you can place it on your fabric where it needs to go. If you can't see through your fabric, uh, I'm sorry, if you can see through your fabric, put it on top and trace it. Now if you can't see through your fabric, turn this over, take a washout marking pencil, a chalk type pencil, Mark over it kind of heavily. Most of you have probably done crayon transfers that way. Once you've done that, you lay this on top of the fabric and trace over it with something kind of blunt, like the end of this wooden skewer works well. And when you do, you'll get your design transferred onto the fabric. Now, once you have design on fabric, the next thing you need is a threaded needle. So let's look at that. And I have one bigger than what you'll be using just so that you can see this. If you try to poke the end of the thread through the needle, it's usually going to bend up and not go through there very well. 
So what I like to do is to pinch the thread flat between my fingers and then slide the eye of the needle between my fingers so that it goes over the thread. And when you do, it'll pop right through. Now to put a knot in the other end of it so it won't pull through our fabric, what you want to do is to take the long end of the thread and hold it against the needle so the thread makes a circle. Once you've got the circle, hold the long end of it and wrap it two or three times around the needle. When you've done that, you just hold those wrapped parts onto the needle, slide it through, and when you do, you get a knot in the end. Now once you have a knot, you want to put your fabric in a hoop. A hoop has two parts, an inner ring and an outer ring. We're going to start with the inner ring. It's the one without the screw on it. Take the fabric with the design on it, lay it over the inner hoop. You lay the outer hoop on top of that and press it down. Now if it's too tight, this one just barely fits. If it's too tight, loosen the screw a little bit and then push it down again until it fits all around. Now I already have a piece that's in a hoop with a threaded needle with part of the design on it. So let's do a running stitch, which is what we use to make the bow. You come up at one end of the design. For this, the needle just goes in the fabric and back out, in the fabric and back out, along the design line. That's why it's called running stitch. You just run in, out, in, out, in, out. When you have several stitches on the needle, you just pull it through the fabric. If it gets tangled up, just untwist it. Pull it till it lies flat, but don't pull it enough to pucker. Then you go in and run two or three more stitches, pull it through, and you're done. The last thing I need to show you is to go to the back, make a knot. So you take the thread to the back, take a tiny stitch, leave a little bit of a loop back here and run the needle through the loop, pull it down tight. That makes a knot. You clip off the extra thread and that ties off your work and finishes it. So that's all there is to finishing this design with the running stitch. You can put this on anything you want to. You can make the stitches longer or shorter. Generally what we do is make the stitches on top of the fabric a little bit longer than the ones under the bottom. And that makes your design line a little bit heavier. It shows up better on the front. Well, Claudia, I love the running stitch. And you know, so many of the old quilts yes. had, had uh, storybook characters right. with the running stitch. You can use the running stitch to go around any outline. You certainly can. Won't you join me in my attic? This is a wonderful little girl's pinafore. Of course, as you know, little pinafores were worn over clothing. This little pinafore is really sweet with the French lace around the, around the whole top of the neckline. But I really like the fact that this is mitered. This is a Swiss trim that has been mitered and that's what makes the, the upper bodice of the pinafore. Pretty, pretty wide French lace. Now if you'll go down to the skirt, it is very sweet and very simple. There are one, two, three, four, five tucks and then a hem and then another piece of the beautiful French lace that is uh, right at the very bottom. By the way, sewn on flat with no gathers. All of these tucks are done by hand, by the way. Every inch of that is stitched in by hand. For our Sewing from the Heart today, I have a letter here from Eileen Swimer from Exton, Pennsylvania, and she writes, Hello, Martha. Calvary Fellowship Church in Exton, Pennsylvania has a sewing group called Common Threads. We meet once a month in the sewing gallery in Exton. Sometimes we have a specific project like costumes for the Easter music production. Often we sew for a specific ministry, making puppets or nursery smocks for the children's department. When we don't have a task that needs to be done for our church by a certain time, we sew for nursing home patients. We make adult size bibs and walker totes. Our visitation team delivers them when they visit the homes around the county. These gifts open the door to many conversations and give our team the opportunity to share the love of God with these special people. What a privilege to use our love of sewing to serve others. Love, Eileen Swimer. Eileen, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for coming to my sewing room today, and I'd like to see you again next time.